Well, that's fine. I'm sure I'll come on. So, all right, so I met most of you guys. My name is Clay. Uh, I am an associate pastor out in the forest at uh, Harvest Church, which is the main G church. It's the only guy church also. Um, I've known Pastor Bob and Tina for probably about eight years now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an honor to be here this morning. I really appreciate being able to be here and speak to you guys. I love, I love talking about God. Um, before we get started, you know, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. I don't know if you guys have done anything for Pastor Bob or, or not and Tina yet, but I know they're great. Their hearts, I know they're great pastors, and I know they love you guys, and they love this church, and they love Mass. And right now, I just want to open up, and I want to pray a blessing over them, because I know they're off kind of celebrating, is it anniversary, I think, yeah. and stuff, and uh, I know they got started later than what they wanted to also, because he called me yesterday, and they were just leaving yesterday oh. to go, and they were supposed to leave a couple of days ago, so I really want them to, to have, I want God to especially bless them, you know, because their hearts and their servanthood um, to, to his kingdom, to, to this church, to this community, in this town. Um, Heavenly Father, we just, we lift up the Castro's to you right now. They are just amazing servants of yours. And we just want to pray a special blessing over them, Lord, that you, you know, not only bless this time that they have together, you know, with each other, but but that you show up, you know, immensely throughout the Lord, and that, that, that every step along the way, there's blessings to be unveiled before them, that they see your hand in everything that happens, Lord, on this on this trip, as they celebrate their anniversary, Lord, oh, that, that things just continue to rain down upon them, Lord, that that your love and your blessings, you know, just continue to occur over and over, Lord, and that they come back with all these different stories about about all the things that have happened and, and, and doors that were open and blessings that just came out of nowhere, and, and that that they know that you are so proud and of them and that you love them so much, Father God. We thank you for them and for their hearts and for their their ministry and and, and just for having that service heart, Lord. We pray a special blessing upon the Castro office. Amen. All right, so just so you guys get to know me a little bit, um, obviously I told you my name's Clay. Um, I've lived in Wisconsin for almost nine years. It'll be nine years in March. Uh, I've been a pastor for ten, ten and a half years roughly. So uh, me and my wife, uh, I actually met her at church. Um, I was on a date with her friend when I met my wife at church. Um, I wasn't a Christian. I'd actually... Um, I, my, I've got a little bit of a different story, and I'm really, like, I love telling it. Um, I was not an atheist, and I wasn't a Christian. I was just talking about I didn't care. I, I really didn't care growing up. Like, I grew up in a household that we didn't go to church, we didn't talk about God, really. And I believed that probably there was something out there, but I didn't really care. I was happy. You know, life was good. Um, I was, you know, 17 years old, I got into a car wreck um, for drinking and driving. And I probably, in all accounts, I should have died. I mean, the car was completely pancaked and smashed. And the cop who showed up on scene, when he got there, was expecting to pull a dead body out of this car because it had, I hit a guardrail and it flipped. And uh, landed on its hood and smashed and slid about 100 feet underneath the guardrail. And when they flipped it over, there was, not only was it smashed, like the, wind, the driver's window went from normal size, it was about that big. Um, but there was also a, a hole that day right where the driver's seat was. And in all, in all reality, they said one of the posts that were ripping through the roof should have just come in and grabbed my head and ripped it off. Um, however, I was a bigger guy in, in high school. Um, I weighed about 320 pounds. And my seat broke because of that on the impact. It must have jarred and just snapped. And so it laid flat. And I came out with a little cut on my arm. That's all. You know, no, no other injuries, nothing, just a little cut of my arm. Um, you know, and I wish I could have said, well, that made a big difference in my life when I decided to turn things around. You know, but it didn't because there was, like, not that many people in my life speaking to me about God. Um, but there were a handful, and they started to do that. They started to plant these seeds in my life. And um, I went off to college uh, the next year, and I wanted, after a semester, being kicked out because of too many on campus alcohol violations. I was. I was an alcoholic, you know, to, in all accounts. Like, I just, I didn't drink every day, 
But I, when I drank, I just drank to oblivion, and it just was destroying my life. And because I got kicked out of college, I had to move back home. And, you know, it's funny because three months after I moved home, my dad got transferred out to Illinois. And I did everything I, I could to try and stay in Virginia where we were living. And it just nothing worked out, so I had to move out there with them. And I wanted to get in a job at a restaurant, and um, there was a, a, a hostess that worked there, and we became friends kind of. And I, I was talking to her one day, and I asked her out on a date, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and she was going to church that night, so she took me to church. You know, and I, she said, yeah, let's, yeah, I'll go on a date with you, but we're going to church tonight, so if you want to go, you have to come with me. And I'm like, okay, whatever, I'll go. You know, I didn't really want to go, but she was cute. And, and so I went with her, and we showed up, and, and I showed up, and uh, on the way in, she introduced me to one of her, her best friends, um, who's actually now my wife. Um, so, because I met her friend, and... There was just something absolutely different about her, and, and her friend invited me back to church the following uh, Wednesday, and, and I just she just would never take no for an answer to make me come back to church. And, and it wasn't because of any interest in me, it was just that she wanted to see me come back to church. Um, and after about three weeks, you know, I remember I was standing amongst a bunch of uh, kids my age, or a little bit younger, and I started to become friends with them, and we were having a conversation one morning before church about dating, and one of the girls was talking about um, going on a date with this guy and, and, and that she really liked him and she was starting to date him and all of our friends started asking her questions about well is he a Christian is he a Christian does he know Christ and you know and she was like well I think so he's a pretty nice guy and like, she just couldn't tell them yes for sure she couldn't say he was a Christian you know, I think so he's nice you know and he's got to be you know and they were like well you know if he's not a Christian you shouldn't date him and and I was so confused at this. I, I, I had to ask. I said, "Why? You know, why? Like, what does that matter?" And, and they kind of explained to me at that point, you know, that the Bible says, "Don't be unequally yoked," and what that means. And you know, when you tie yourself down with a non-believer and stuff like that, that it really, really will affect your relationship with the Lord. Um, and and I just blurted out, "Well, I'm not a Christian." And, and one of my buddies, you know, just turns to me, looks at me, and he puts his hand on my shoulder, and says, "Don't worry, you will be." It was simple as that. And then that morning, the pastor's message was all geared towards that. And there was an altar call at the end. And, you know, heads bowed, you know, and, you know, raise your hand if you can honestly say, if you don't know that if you die today, Jesus, you know, you go and stand before Christ and, and make it into heaven. You know, and I raised my hand. And then he said, come, you know, if you had your hand raised, come up front. And then I said, I'm not going up front, you know, because I was too embarrassed. And my friend, the guy that said that was actually right, right behind me. He leans forward and goes, I'll go with you. And, and we went up, and, and I got saved that day. And, and that, that was 15 years ago, you know, this, this last summer. So, uh, you know, that's a little bit about me and, and my story. Well, from there, I actually went on to college, to Christian LaVarge College at Vanderbilt University. And then I and there got put the call of being a pastor in my life. And, you know, me and my wife um, uh, were married throughout college, and uh, they're at our they're at our church in the forest. And, and I, me and her, her name's Teresa. And we have three kids. My oldest is Talon; he's eight. Lorelai is, is our middle child; she's six and a half. And then our youngest is is uh, Lillian. And and we have a great family. And God has really changed the dynamics of my relationship with Him. I'm going to step down into my water. Um, my relationship or our relationship as a family with him over the last few years. Um, you know, it's it's funny. You think you know God because you come to church, you, you read your Bible every now and then, you worship him. And all of a sudden, like, stuff starts to happen in your life. Um, and you're kind of blown away. You're like, wow, how do I deal with this? You know, what's going on? So... Um, a week, three years ago in February, February 24, 2012, our third child was born, Lillian, and uh, everything's fine. We, you know, came out, she's fine, she's healthy. Um, a couple days later, we go home, uh, and then, like, a couple of days after that, um, my mom and sister were going to come out, like a week, week and a half later, my mom and sister were to come out. <laughs> and, sorry, 
Um, we get a phone call. Actually, I get a couple of emails from my sister um, one morning because she had flown from New York to South Carolina, where my parents live, um, and she's going to fly out here with my mom from there. And I started getting these emails from my sister, and they're kind of cryptic. You know, asking what, oh, what, you know, what's your schedule like today? You know, when can you call? We, we want to talk to you tonight. We should see how everything's going. And I'm like, that's weird, man. Like, why wouldn't they just, why don't you just call? Like, and then it's another email, because I sent her an email saying, well, I work till 8 o'clock tonight, and, you know, I needed, I had a couple things I needed to do afterwards, and so I want to be home till 9 or 10, our time, which is 10 or 11 in South Carolina. And I get another email, well, can, can, you, can you skip doing stuff after work and just give us a call? I'm like, you know, something's bad. So I call immediately. I don't even wait till I get off work. I'm like, you gotta, what's going on? You gotta tell me. And uh, I'll remember this conversation for the rest of my life. Um, my dad gets on the phone. Sorry. My dad gets on the phone and he's a, you know, he's a, I can tell something's different in his voice. And he gives, he just starts talking to me and he's like, telling me about some illnesses that he's had over, over the last month or so. Um, pains and stuff. And some pains and stuff that he, uh, he um, actually, uh, um, comes out and tells us, uh, tells me that he has um, cancer, uh, lung cancer stage four, and that the doctors are giving him about oh a year, year and a half to live, you know. And man, I remember, you know, crying. I'm, like, even worse than what I am now. Like I, I don't think he understood half the stuff I was saying at first, and then I calmed down. And I just had to have a conversation with my dad because, you know, my dad, in all purposes, did not know the war. Did, like, like, he's telling me that, this, that he's dying and that he doesn't know Christ at all. Like, and I know that he doesn't know Christ um, based on the way that we were raised. And, and he, he grew up in a, in a family that went to church and that, that did worship and, and served the Lord. And I, I remember just bawling and, and thinking, like, you know, I'm not afraid that my dad's going to die. I'm afraid that my dad's going to die not knowing Jesus Christ, you know. And, and I told him that. I just came out and said, Dad, i got to know, like, where you stand with Christ, you know, and all these things. And, and like, he came, he had actually known for a couple weeks before he told, told us. And he wasn't going to tell us until after my mom and my sister came to visit but luckily, my sister was down there, and she kind of knew something was different and something was up. So um, he committed his life to Christ that night on the phone, which was amazing because after that, like I wasn't worried about what was going to happen um, to him, you know, if he did pass away. Um, and uh, you know, I just there was there's a sense of joy there because he knew Christ. Now. And no matter what, if he dies tomorrow of a heart attack or six months from cancer, he's going to go to heaven. He's going to spend eternity with the Lord. Um, and then so he starts chemo and, and all this stuff. And, and we fast forward um, about two and a half months. Um, so right in the middle of May, we start noticing something's wrong with their father. You know, there's there's little signs that she's not gaining weight, she's not wanting to eat, um, she's weak all the time, um, she's really pale, she can't like cry, like she wants to cry, you know, you see a baby's face and it cries, and the, you know, we can see her wanting to cry, but there's no sound coming out at all, absolutely nothing, and, and she can't move her head back and forth anymore, so we take her back and forth to the doctor, and uh, you know, we, uh, the doctor doesn't really seem to notice anything super wrong except for like she hasn't really gained weight for over a month. And, and, but she got really looking really bad. So our friends who were nurses encouraged us to take her to the, 
Children's Hospital, which we did. And, uh, that was on June 2nd, because um, it was my other daughter's. We were having a birthday party for her. Um, and that after the birthday party, my wife and a friend of ours went up with her other daughter, Lillian, to the hospital, to the emergency room. And they, they go up, and they, they go to check her in. And as soon as they get done getting all her information, they grab her instantly and just rush her back. Because um, they knew something was wrong. And for the next two months, we um, we spent in the, the the pediatric ICU with our daughter because they were they were trying to diagnose her and figure out what was wrong with her because there was a lot of things that were going wrong and they couldn't pinpoint it. Well, it turns out she has a genetic disease um, called a um, mitochondrial disease. Thank you, ma'am. I am an emotional person. I will cry at everything. Um, but she, uh, she has a mitochondrial disease, so supposedly, somehow, like, me and my wife both have defect, a defective gene that we both shot to her. Um, but over a two-month period, they go through all these different tests to try and find out what's wrong, and they come out with, we believe it's this, you know, and because of this, this is what we're going to have to do now. And, like, so, like, about a month into our stay into the ICU, um, we have to make the decision to, to have a trach put in our daughter because she's going to need a trach and a ventilator to breathe. Um, a feeding tube. She had to have a muscle biopsy. You know, and, and you know all these things are going on. And um, so, in the midst of everything, you know, me and my wife are are living separate um, because she's up at the hospital. I'm at home with her other kids, or vice versa. I'm up at the hospital with her, her daughter, and she's at home with the other two kids. And um, in the midst of it, we get a, I get a phone call one morning from my sister, knowing my dad was in the hospital from some, a couple, you know, just for because he wasn't doing very well, and, and he he wanted to pass away, you know. So on the day that we bury my dad, you know, I've got my two older kids with me in South Carolina. On the day that we bury my dad, my daughter is back here down the road at the UW in surgery having her trip put in and everything. I just remember that day. And I was, you know, rejoicing that my dad was in heaven, even though he was gone, I'll miss him, but, you know, to know the fact that he chose Christ, and not only did he choose Christ that one night on the phone with me, that he, he, he walked it out, he started going to church, and, you know, um, confess to the to the pastor of that church, you know, his shortcomings and that he, he was following Christ and that he wanted to be baptized and, and everything. You know, a 64-year-old man walked up, up front one morning for an altar call to confess, you know, Christ to the pastor. I remember that pastor telling me that was probably one of the coolest things he's ever seen in his ministry to see an older gentleman like that do that. But, uh, you know, I'm rejoicing that we're, you know, that my dad's in heaven, you know, and, and, and also mourning that, that we won't see him anymore. But at the same time, like, I'm totally going crazy about what's going on with my daughter and if she's making it through the surgery okay and me and my wife are being separated because of all of this. And um, she couldn't come um, and, uh, to the funeral and everything. But throughout all of that, you know, the craziness, I just had to stop with life. And I said, man, God, what's going on? Why is this happening, you know? And, and it struck me in that one instance, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Like, it struck me right there that I didn't really know God that well. Like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I read the Bible. I do all that. But, like, still, like, I didn't know God that well. And, and you know, it was brought to my attention, you know, and, and it, 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 this scripture had always been on, like, one that I've always been drawn back to ever since I became a Christian, ever since I started reading the Bible. You know, it's in, in Matthew chapter 7, and it's the one where Christ stands and says, many will stand before me one day and say, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, I never knew you. And I always wondered what that meant. You know, what does that mean that many will stand before him saying, Lord, Lord, you know, I never knew you. And and then he follows it up saying, or they, you know, when he says, I never knew you, they follow it up by saying, well, did, you know, didn't we go to church? Didn't we participate in this? You know, we, we were there when people got healed. You know, and people were saved, you know, because of the ministry we were involved in. And he'll say, 
death, but I never knew you. Like, like in that, at that instance, God revealed to me when, when Christ is like, I knew you, like, he wants more than us just to know who he is and all the stuff that he did. You know, he wants us to know him intimately. You know, I have a wife, and I know her intimately. You know, spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, you know, all different ways. I mean, I know my wife. Like, I can sit in the same room with my wife, and we can have a conversation without even talking. Like, I, she can give me a look, and I can know if I'm in trouble. I can know if, <laughs> if, I'm, if, if I've done something right. You know, I can know if she needs something or if she's hurting without her saying a word. You know, and that's the kind of relationship God wants us to have with him. You know, in, in the, the book of James, it says, you know, God says, or in the book of James, it says, draw near to, to me and I'll draw near to you. God says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. You know, God does never move. God's always in the same place. It's us that, that wander away or stray away or just kind of, you know, we just find ourselves kind of, you know, being separated little by little because of the choices we make. You know, and on that day, God said, you know, it's great that, that you're a pastor. It's great that you read my word. It's great that you pray um, and that you worship. But I want more than that. I want to know you. And I want you to know me. Um, and at that point, I was like, so how do I do that? Like, you know, I had to change my whole thinking, my whole, my whole uh, idea. And then I go back to uh, one of my favorite bird verses in the Bible. It comes from Exodus. Um, Exodus chapter 33. And they talk about Moses. And basically, Exodus 33, verse 17 says this, starting in verse 17, and we'll go through the end of, of Exodus 33. Um, it says, Yahweh answers Moses, I will do what you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Please, let me see your glory. Yahweh said, I will let all my goodness pass in front of you, and there I will call out my name, Yahweh. I will be kind to anyone I want to. I will be merciful to anyone I want to. But you can't see my face because no one may see my see me alive. Then Yahweh said, Look, there's a place near me. Stand by this rocky cliff. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a crevice in the cliff and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you'll see my back, but my face must not be seen. You know, Moses desired to see God. You know, to see God. And 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 God let him see him, but he Moses couldn't see his face, but like you know, if you go on to read 34, like, God changed Moses so much that when he came down off of Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, the second time he came down, he came down and, like, he scared all the other Israelites because his face was glowing because of his encounter with God. Like, it says his face was glowing. He had to go, you know, he went and went on and putting, like, making a veil on something putting over his face, partly because that glow actually started to lessen and lessen, but... It also scared the people when he first came down because of, of I mean, that's that's what a true encounter with God looks like. I mean, it changes you. It changes you spiritually. It changes you physically, emotionally. I mean, it changes every aspect of you. You know, and, and I wanted that. I wanted to to see God's glory the way that Moses saw God. I mean, I mean, there's a song out there that says like uh, that talks about this, um, and it says, you know, the cloud passed by that Moses stepped in. You know, and I wanted to step in. Presence into His glory, just like Moses did, and and I really was like, God, how do I do that? And He's like, You've got to know who I am. If you don't know who I am, you will never have that intimate relationship with me. And and so I'm like, You're right, man. I can't if I don't have, if I don't know truly who you are, you know, inside and out, God. How can I ever expect to really know you and to be changed? You know, Psalm 148 says this. Psalm 148 says, Hallelujah, praise Yahweh from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, His entire heavenly army. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heaven and the water above the sky. Let them praise the name of Yahweh because they were created by His command. He sent them in their places forever and ever. He made it a law that no one can break. Praise Yahweh from the earth. Praise Him. 
Large sea creatures in all the ocean depth, lightning and hail, snow and fog, strong winds that obey his commands, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedar trees, wild animals and all domestic animals, crawling animals and birds, king of the earth, kings of the earth and all his people, officials and all judges on the earth, young men and women, old and young together. Let them praise the name of Yahweh, because his name is higher above all others. His glory is above heaven and earth. He has given his people a strong leader, someone praiseworthy for his faithful ones, for the people of Israel, the people who are close to him. Hallelujah. You know, right there in Psalms, it tells us to praise God, to praise Yahweh. And it, that's all it talks about. Praise him over and over. It talks about all the things that he's made, all the things that, that are out there that are actually singing his praises, all these things that he's created. Not just us, like, you know, the trees and the birds and the hailstorms and the winds. They all sing praises to his name. You know, in the Old Testament times, a name was not only identification, but an identity as well. Many times, a special meaning was attracted, attached to the name. Names had, among other purposes, an, explana uh, an explanatory purpose. Like, for an example, there's, in 1 Samuel 25, 25, there's a gentleman named Nabal, and his name actually means fool. Um, and his wife is Abigail, and like she actually explains that because in First Samuel twenty five twenty five, David, King David, actually sends a regiment of men to, to kind of look after Nabal and Abigail and take care of them and go wherever they go so that none of their their um, possessions are, are stolen, or they're not attacked, and nothing bad happens to them. And and Nabal goes off and he actually like, curses David's men. And, and treats him really bad. And David's on his King David's on his way out there to actually punish him all everything. And Abigail knows this. Abigail knows how foolish of a, of a mistake her husband made. So she rides out, you know, in the middle of the night to meet King David and to bring an uh, 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 offering to him um, to make amends for what her husband has done. And and in this, you know, she explains like that his name that the ball actually does mean foolish one, you know. And that, that, that he is just like living up to his name, you know, for, and it says this, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. You know, we see that names mean something. Like, if you go through the Old Testament and you, and, and you read just how people name their kids, like, look at Esau and Jacob. You know, Esau came out and he was hairy. You know, that's what Esau means. Jacob came out attached to, to Esau's heel. You know, heel grabber is what Jacob means. You know, names mean something. You know, my name is Clay. And like the, the meaning of that is like and like if you look it up in, a, in one of those baby names books or just one of the, the meaning of name it means mortal, you know. Well, that's perfect, man. I'm mortal. Like, you know what? I know that. I, I figured that out. You know what? I came to that realization over the last couple of years with everything that went on, man. I'm mortal. Sooner or later, we all are gonna die here on this earth. This body will go away, and we'll receive our heavenly body. Um, but names mean something. You know, so throughout Scripture, God reveals Himself to us through His names. You know, and that's one of the things that God put on my heart when He says, "I want you to know Me." And I'm like thinking, "How? Oh, well, like one day I'm listening to some worship songs, and there's a song out there called uh, "The Names of God," and all, all it is is this awesome song with that goes over and it says the name, different names of God in Hebrew, and what they mean, you know, how they're translated. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to that. And I'm not even thinking, I'm like, oh, this is a pretty cool song. And then all of a sudden, God says, it's more than, like, you look at the names. Like, what do those names truly mean? Like, and how do they represent me? Like, do you know all my names? Do you know all the aspects of my name? You know, if I got up here and I just said, hey, I'm Clay. I'm, I'm a pastor on the Harvest, you know, Church of the Forest. And I just preached this morning. You guys would know absolutely nothing about me. You wouldn't know anything about my family, what's gone on in my life. You just know Clay and that he's a pastor out there. You know, but now you guys know a little bit more of my background because I shared it with you. Well, guess what? That's what God did throughout the scriptures is he shared with us who he is exactly through all the different names, you know. And and as I read my Bible this morning, like, you know, obviously, like, you know, in my Bible, like, this is the names of God Bible. And, like, when you're reading throughout it, it actually differentiates the different names. You know, I'm, for so many years I'm reading the Bible and you, you see either God or Lord, you know. God or Lord. Every now and then you'd see Yahweh or something like that. But here you see all the different names throughout the scriptures where they're actually applied. Like Yahweh, Adonai, you know, El, Elohim, El Shaddai, um, Jehovah, Jehovah, Rapha, Jehovah, Ra, you know, and, and 
and all that. And, and then it starts to actually sink in, like, wow, man, God is so different. And that's how he reveals himself. He reveals himself throughout Scripture through these various names. You know, when we study these names that he reveals to us in the Bible, we will better understand who he really is. The meanings behind God's names reveal the central personality and nature of the one who bears them. Like, so, so I asked you this morning, like, who is God to you? You know, think about that. Because, like, if I were to answer that four or five years ago, I would have a totally different answer. And I hope, and I told I told my church after everything that I went through and and stuff that with all those experiences and with my reality of just falling down at the Father's feet, falling down at the at, at Christ's feet, and 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 just trying to figure out what was going on and and who they really were. I really believe I would, would have been one of those people that stood before him that morning and he would have said, I never knew you. You know, because I, I didn't have a relationship with him. I was, you know, just walking out what I saw a lot of other people walk out. And I was a pastor, and yeah, I read my Bible, and I prayed, and, 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 and I did all the things that, like, almost like a checklist. Like, you, you think, okay, if I do this, this, and this, you know, I'm good. And, and it's funny, because all God really wants is just for us to want him and to know him and to have a relationship with him. So who is God to you? Is he your most high God? Is he all sufficient one? Is he master? Is he Lord of peace? The Lord who will provide? Is he your father? We must be careful not to make God into an it or a thing to which we pray. He is our Jehovah Ra, the Lord our shepherd. God knows us by our name. Shouldn't we know him by his? You know, in Matthew chapter 6, Verse 7, you know, Christ is t teaching the disciples how to pray. You know, he's telling them not to babble on like other people in other religions do. In Matthew 6, 7, he starts off saying, when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like this. By like, like, don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask Him. And then he says, pray like this. He says, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. That's the first thing he starts off with. Hallowed be your name. You know, to hallow a thing is to make it holier, to set it apart. To set it apart, to be exalted as being worthy of absolute devotion. That's what, what we just read in Psalm 148. All about praising and exalting his name. Set up and setting it apart because he is creator and master of all. You know, and he is worthy of all praise and all exaltations. So how the name of God is to regard him with complete devotion and loving admiration. God's name is of the, mo of the utmost importance. You know, uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9.5 says this. It says, Then the leaders of the, the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pathathiah, called out to the people, stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed, may your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. It says, you alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in it. You preserve them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. You know, it says, may your glorious name be praised. You know, therefore, we, we ought to preserve it a position of grave significance in our minds and our hearts to do that. We should never take his name lightly. You know, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 says this, You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. You know, there it tells us we shouldn't misuse his name. You know, that we won't go unpunished if we misuse it. So we have to understand it. And if you don't understand it, you're going to we'll wind up misusing it. You know, if I, if I go out and buy some item at Target, let's say a, a new vacuum cleaner or something like that, and, and I don't understand how to use it, there's a good chance I'm going to misuse that somehow. And, and when I misuse it, there's a good chance I'm going to break it or damage it. You know, right? You know, most guys are like that. I don't like reading instructions. Like, my wife loves, like, with all the little Legos and toys and stuff. I, I, I can't do that stuff, man, with all those instructions and stuff for my kids. But she'll sit down and she'll spend hours and hours helping me put these things together because she likes instructions and she likes order. And I like to just, well, I think this part fits together and, you know, just hit it and try and make it work, you know. 
that's how I am, you know. But but right here it tells me, like, when it comes to the name of the Lord, man, I've got to know it and understand it. You know, otherwise I'm going to misuse it. You know, in, in Leviticus 22, 32, it says this. Do not bring shame on my holy name, for I will display my holiness among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who makes you holy. It was I who rescued you from the land of Egypt, that I might be your God, I am the Lord. You know, we, we must always rejoice in it and think deeply upon it the true meaning of, of God's name. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, 7, it tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then I go back to John chapter 5, verse 19, 20, 20 and it, there Jesus tells us that, he says, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also do, does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. So God must be the same yesterday, today, and forever then. If, if, if Hebrews tells us that Christ is the same yesterday, today, today and forever, and in John chapter 5, Jesus is telling us that he, everything we've ever seen or heard him do, he saw, and, he saw and heard from the Father. He did nothing on his own accord. He saw and, and, and heard. So, so we know God's the same also today. And, and we know that because in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Jesus, they said when he was born, to name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, so we have to understand who God is in order to truly have this relationship, you know, with them. And I brought a soccer ball with me this morning um, because I do a Saturday night service at my church. And, and we actually went and spent like 20 plus weeks, like 26 plus weeks, you know, just taking a name of God each Saturday night and just going through it and just understanding that name more and more. Um, you know, and, and an image of a soccer ball came to mind as I was, as I was going through that, that series of just the different names of God. And, you know, trust me, there's more than just 26 names of God in the Bible. Um, that it's referred to, but um, you know, I, got a, I started looking at a soccer ball um, and thinking, look at all the patches on it, you know, and then God said, you know what, what would happen, he, he, he just brought this out immediately, like, he said, what would happen if you took one of the patches away? Is it still a soccer ball? Can, is it perfect, can it still fulfill its purpose as a soccer ball if one patch is missing? And then I'm like, no, because there's a hole in it, there's no air in it. It's going to be flat. You can't kick it. You can't play with it. You're going to be pretty disappointed with it, and it's useless. And he's like, exactly. So if you don't understand who I am and, and who I truly am, I'm like that soccer ball. There's so many different patches that make me up. There's so many different names that make up who I am. You know, I'm not just clay, a pastor. You know, I'm. You know, there's a lot more to me than just that. You know, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a son. You know, I'm a troublemaker. You go back to when I was a kid, you know. Um, I'm still a troublemaker just in a different way. Um, you know, there, there's so many different aspects to who that make that make me up. And if that's that's the reality about me, then how much more greater is that about God like, that make him up? Amen. And I like look at the soccer ball and I'm thinking, wow, there's a lot of patches on it. And if one is missing then it's not what it really is, well, then if I don't have the complete understanding and knowledge of who God is, then, then there's something lacking in my relationship with him, and, and it's going to be deflated and flat, and it's not going to be able to serve the purpose that it's supposed to. So I really started taking an interest in the different names of God, you know. And that's what I just want to share with you this morning, is, is some of the different names of God, where they're found, what they mean, you know, just so that you guys get an understanding of who God is, who, who this great being, the Almighty, is. And, and, and there's so many different great aspects of him, um, that as I went through it over weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks with, with my church, um, it really changed the makeup of who we were. Um, and and like we, we started to seek him deeper and deeper. Um, so the first name I want to share with you this morning is El Shaddai. And that, that means all-sufficient one, Lord God Almighty. In the Old Testament, El Shaddai occurs seven times in the, in the Old Testament. Um, El Shaddai is first used in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. So Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, and this is what it says. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to him. He said to him, Abraham, I am El Shaddai. Live in my presence with integrity. I will give you my promise, and I will give you very many descendants. Immediately, Abraham bowed, and his face was touching the ground. 
El is another name that is translated as God and can be used in conjunction with other words to designate various aspects of God's character. Another word, much like Shaddai, um, and from which many believe it derived is Shad, meaning breast in Hebrew. Some other scholars believe that the name is derived from an Akkadian word, Sadu, meaning mountain, suggesting strength and power. This refers to God, God completely nourishing, satisfying, and supplying his people with all their needs as a mother would her child. Connected with the word for God, El, this denotes a God who freely gives nourishment and blessing. He is our sustainer. You know, right there we see, like, when he's talking to Abraham, he's, he's saying, do this, make this covenant with me, I will take care of all your needs. You know, and not only your needs, but the needs of your many descendants that I promised. You know, he is the all-sufficient one. He is Lord God Almighty, right? I mean, all-sufficient one. He'll take care of any one of our needs. Whatever your need is, whatever you're going through today, whatever you, you're worried about, whatever, you, you, you know, you, you can't get off your mind because, you, you, you know, he'll take care of that. You know, whether it's finances, whether it's marital issues, whether it's, you know, um, things going on at home with, with your kids or an illness or sickness or, you know, you name it. He's the all-sufficient one. He will take care of it because he is Lord God Almighty. You know, there's further references of, of the name El Shaddai in the Old Testament. Just a couple of them are Genesis 28.3, Genesis 35.11, Genesis 43.14, and Genesis 48.3. Another name for that for God is, is El Elyon, which means the Most High God. In the Old Testament, El Elyon occurs 28 times. It occurs 19 in Psalms. El Elyon is first used in Genesis 14 and 18. So in Genesis 14 18, this is how they use that name of God. Genesis 14 18, this is what it says. It says, Then King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of El Elyon. He blessed Abram and said, Blessed is Abram by El Elyon, maker of heaven and earth. Blessed is El Elyon, who has handed your enemies over to you. Right there we see it used three times. That one specific name, the Most High God. You know, El is another name that's translated as God. We, we saw that earlier. Elion literally means most high, most high God, and is used both objectively and substantially, uh, substantively throughout the Old Testament. It expresses the extreme sovereignty and ma majesty of God and his highest permanence. When the two words are combined, El Elion, it can be translated as the most exalted or most high God. You know, and that's who he is, man. That's that's a reality of who he is. Like, like he is the most high God. Like, it, it baffles me whenever I hear um, people like throw around the name of the Lord in vain, like, and just you know use God in, in, a, in a way that is not flattering to Him. Like even in the statement, you know, you know, and, you know, oh my goodness, or oh my God, you know, I'm like, you know, there's so many people I hear use that, and I'm like, I just want to say, well, well what about it? Or you know, I just want to bring that up to your attention because that's His name. That's the Most High God. You know, in, in other foreign lands, if you were to use like a king, a king's name in that vein, you would be put to death. You know, I mean, this is our God, creator of heaven and earth, the most I got. Like, we just throw his name around sometimes. Like, and it's because we don't have an understanding of him. We don't understand, like, the awesomeness of who he is sometimes. You know, another name for God is Adonai, which means Lord or Master. Um, in the Old Testament, Adonai actually occurs, just in the Old Testament, 434 times. And there are heavy uses of Adonai in Isaiah. It occurs 200 times in Ezekiel alone and appears 11 times in just Daniel chapter 9. And it's first used in Genesis 15 too. And we see here it says, Abram asked Adonai, Yahweh, what will you give me? Since I'm going to die without children, Eliezer of Damascus will inherit my household given me no children, so this member of my household will be my heir. So he's asking him, Lord, Master, you know, what will you give me? You know, he's showing a reliance on him. It's like, okay, I am your servant, you know, in a way. You're my Lord, and you're my Master, and I'm your servant. You know, and, and that's who God still is today, you know. Let, 
Like, he is our, our Lord and our Master. And we are to serve him, you know? And that's why we were created. You know, Adonai is a verbal parallel to Yahweh and Jehovah. Adonai is, is plural. The singular is Adon. In reference to God, the plural Adonai is used. When the singular Adon is used, it usually refers to a human lord. Adon is used 215 times to refer to men, occasionally in Scripture and predominantly in the Psalms. The singular Adon is used to refer to God as well. Um, you know, God is our Lord and our Master. You know, especially throughout the Old Testament, we see that. And then it's awesome to see the change in the New Testament when he, when we're told, okay, we're now his children. We are actually his children because of Christ and what Christ has done for us. You know, another name for God, and one of the most prominent ones that we know of is Yahweh. You know, I think everybody, for the most part, has heard Yahweh before. And, and you know, Yahweh is such a, a prominent name for God. In fact, the um, Israelites when they were um, transcripting the Bible and writing it out, you know, and, trans and, and over and over again and making copies, they would never ever write out the actual word Yahweh. They would only write YHWH. It was held to such a high standard that they were so afraid that they would, they would like, misuse it or that, that they would be punished, you know, it was, that they didn't even speak it. They wouldn't even say Yahweh because of how um, high of a standard that, that it was. And, and how exalted of a name it was, that they were afraid of using it. Um, in the Old Testament, Yahweh occurs 6,519 times. The name is used more than any other name of God. Yahweh is first used in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And there it says, This is the account of heaven and earth when they were created at the time when Yahweh Elohim made earth and heaven. Wild bushes and plants were not on the earth yet, because Yahweh had set rain on the earth. Also, there was no one to farm the land. Yahweh is the promised name of God. You know, if you remember when, when Moses says, Who do I tell him sent me? And he says, Tell him, you know, Yahweh sent you. Tell him, I am sent you. Mm -hmm. You know, and that one moment when God says, Tell him, I am sent you, that's all encompassing of every name possible that God could be. Because it's so open-ended. It's I am. You know, he says, I am. You know, whatever need you have, whatever you're going through, I am. You just have to rely on me. I am it. I'm I'm there for you. And the name of God by which is too holy to voice is actually spelled YHWH without vowels. YHWH is referred to as the Tetragrammaton, which simply means the four letters. Yahweh comes from the Hebrew letters Yud. Hey, they, and, and hey. While uh, Yahweh is first used in Genesis 2, God did not reveal himself as Yahweh until Exodus 3. The modern spelling is Yahweh includes vowels to assist in pronunciation. You know, it's awesome to see how God reveals himself over and over again throughout the Bible and the different names that he has. You know, another one is, is Jehovah Mekadishkem. Mekedi Jehovah which means the Lord who sanctifies you, the Lord who makes you holy. You know, He separates you apart. He sets you apart, and He makes you holy. You know, and that you see that first occurrence in Exodus thirty-one thirteen. And there it says, Exodus thirty-one thirteen. So Yahweh said to Moses, say to the Israelites, be sure to observe my days of worship. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come, so that you will know that I am Jehovah of Mekadishka, who makes you holy. So that he sanctifies and he separates them. You know, he took the Israelites and he separated them as his own, so that people would know that they were his. You know, he sent Jesus Christ so that once we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we are not sanctified and we are actually set apart and we are His chosen ones, that we are His children, the Bible says. You know, other names are Jehovah Sikinu, which means the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, Jehovah Ra, the Lord my shepherd, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner, El Olam, the everlasting God, and then Elohim, which just means God. You know, and these are just a handful of that we see 
throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible. And one of my favorite is, is Abba. Abba Father. You know, we find that in the New Testament. You find it actually three different times in the New Testament. And the first time you see it is in Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. This is what it says there. And this is how they use his name in Mark 14. And verse 35 says, After walking a little farther, he, farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, he might not have to suffer what was ahead of him. He said, Abba, Father, you can do anything. Take this cup of suffering away from me. But let your will be done rather than mine. You know, we see Jesus Christ right there calling out to God the Father. You know? And he calls him Abba. You know, Abba means daddy or means father. Um, it means daddy father. You know, when he says Abba Father, he's actually calling him daddy father. You know, that's probably one of the most intimate names that I've seen that I've seen in the Bible talking about God. Have you ever thought about God truly as your Abba Father, your Daddy Father? Because that that that's something that, that I never did. Because like I always thought, oh man, I'm, I gotta lift His name up so high, and, and He's so holy. And then I get to this, and I'm thinking, you know, oh, I see it a couple different times. And Mark fourteen thirty six, Romans eight fifteen, Galatians four six, where they refer to Him as Abba Father, Daddy Father, and He wants that relationship with us, man. Like, he wants us to know him as Daddy Father. Just like he wants us to know him as Jehovah seeking new the Lord our righteousness, or Yahweh, or Adonai, Lord and Master. He wants us to know all these different aspects of him. You know, my dad just wasn't my dad, or wasn't, his name was Mark. It just wasn't, he just wasn't Mark, he was my father. Like, trust me, there was different sides to him. There was the nice side of my dad. There was the, the upset side of my dad, the, the mad side of my dad, the giving side of my dad, you know, there are so many different ways I could describe my own earthly father. And if I didn't know all of those different things, he wouldn't have been so special to me. And we wouldn't have had the relationship that we did. Same with my mom, you know, and same with my wife or my kids and same with me. Like, you know, when you get, when you meet somebody and say, and you exchange names, yeah, you, you start a bond a little bit, but you just know each other a little bit, but the more you get to know somebody and all their different personalities and all the different um, aspects of them, that relationship evolves and molds and, and you become so much more bonded together. You know, think about the people that you're best friends with, you know, and how well you know them and how well you know their different personalities and, and the, the nicknames you have for them and the different things you call them, you know. You know, there's there's guys that if I walked into a room, they'd yell out names and my some of my other friends wouldn't understand why they're calling me Moose or Campbell Soup Kid. You know, or all these, or you know, one of my new girls was Opie on steroids because I was redheaded, freckle face, and really big guy. Um, so, you know, people want to understand that, but that's how these people knew me, and those are the aspects of, of, of me that they knew. You know, the same with with God, man. Like all these different names represent something different about Him, and the different ways that that He serves us, and that He's there for us, and that He loves us. And that he wants to take care of us. And then here we see Abba Father, which is Daddy Father. You know, when I think about that, I think about, you know, crawling up into a dad, like my dad's lap as a kid and just spending time with him. And same with thing as a dad, you know, having my kids come up. And there's nothing I love more than having them jump up on my lap and sit there and, and holding them and spending time with them and talking with them. Um, and that's one of the best parts about being a father or a dad. And I think that's the, one of the best parts about God is when we just... Take everything out the table, and we just crawl up into his lap, and we just share with him what, what's going on in our lives, and then we, whether it's good or bad, because he wants that man. He wants us to climb up into his lap. Over and over again throughout the New Testament, we see that the relationship that is now before us is that we are his children. You know, and in, in, in the Gospel of John, you know, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and I believe it's in John chapter like 15 or 16 where he says, like, I no longer talk to you as servants, you know, because you're more than that. You know. To me, you're my friends now, you know, and that that you know God is now your father. Like in Galatians, it talks about us being children of the mo of God. You know that, that he what, that he has got an inheritance for us because we are his children of, 
full inheritance, you know. And we have to take ownership of that, that we are God's children, you know. When they call Jesus Christ King of Kings and Lord of Lords, well, guess what? Like, if he's the Son of God, but yet now we're called the children of God, the sons and daughters of God, too, guess what? If he's the King of Kings, then we're all kings, too, because we are God's children. If, we're, if he's the Lord of Lords, then we're all lords, too. You know, God has separated us. He has made, sanctified us, you know. That is part of who he is and, and part of loving us and us choosing to follow him. And, and, and all of this together makes up who God is, not just God, you know. It's so tough for me to go to a different Bible and just read God or Lord now because I know that that name means something else. And I want to know in which fashion they're talking about God in that one instance because it, it actually will make that piece of scripture so much more meaningful to know that this is the God they're talking about or this is the aspect of God they're talking about. You know, and when I heard Abba Father for the first time, I was like, Daddy Father, and I'm like, that is amazing. And then I saw how some people actually use that. You know, that they truly meant it, that they went after him as a Daddy Father and that they just wanted to just sit in his lap. You know, it's amazing. And and I go back to that scripture in Hebrews where it says God is this, or Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we know that's the truth then about God. You know, and I go back then to the very beginning in Genesis when God set up the earth and He set up Eden, Garden of Eden. He put Adam, created Adam and Eve there. And you know, you know how He describes making man and woman. He says that we were made, and His and and, and He actually says we were made in their image and their life. He said, let us make them in our image and our likeness. You know, we're made in the likenesses of God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, man. Like, that's how they make you made us. He didn't make us just randomly. He said, let us make them in our image and our likeness. So we're actually made in the image of God, in the image of the Father and in His likeness. So if we can't understand who God is, we're going to have a tough time understanding who we are. Because we were made in His image and likeness. You know, we were set apart. You know, I love reading that first chapter of Genesis, especially around that area, because then he goes on to talk about, like, at the end of every day in Genesis, day one, two, he said, and everything that he made, you know, he looked at everything he made, and he said it was good. Good. Day two, three, four, five. Day six, after he made man, and we were made in His image and likeness, he looks over everything he created, and he says, very good. Not just good, he says, very good. So when he looks at me and you guys, and he, and, and he's, he knows how he made us. You know, in Jeremiah it talks about how he knew us before we, before we were even created. He knew us before he even placed us in the womb of our mothers. And he created us with purposes. And he was making us in his image and his likeness. He was making us for a purpose. And when he looks at you, he says, very good. He looks at you as a father would. And he says, I love you. I mean, think about that. I mean, if you have kids, think about how you look at your kids and how you love them unconditionally. You know, I think about my kids, and, and even when they get in trouble, I can't help them out sometimes, but I love them so much. You know, I think about people um, who have kids that have really messed up in life. You know, I saw an interview, I don't know how many years ago it was, with, um, in, uh, with Jeffrey Dahmer's father. And everybody knows, pretty much knows who Jeffrey Dahmer was. He, he was a mass murderer. Um, and like they asked him about, do you, they, you know, how do you feel like your son? And he's like, he's my son. I, I love him. I, I, you know, he, I didn't agree with what he did. He was ashamed. But he's like, he's my son. I, I can't stop loving him. You know, and that's the truth. Like God looks at us the same way. No matter what we've done or where we're at, He still loves us because that's who He is, man. No matter what, He still loves us. You know, He loves us because He loves us because He loves us. And that's not going to change. There's nothing that we can do that's going to make God love us anymore. But the cool part is there's nothing that we can do that's going to make Him love us any less. You know, because He is our Father. And as our Father, He loves us because we are His children. You know, and, and God made us in, in, their, in His likeness and image. And, and I look at that and I'm like, wow. But to truly understand who I am, I have to understand who He is. I can't do that without understanding all the different aspects of them. Just like if I took this out and I just showed it to a kid who never seen a soccer ball before, they're not going to know this is a soccer ball. You know, they're just they might know it's a ball of some sort, but I can have a volleyball, 
a soccer ball or a basketball. They just they might know they're all ball, but they won't know what the proper use is for it. You know, if we don't know God intimately, if we don't know him by by his different names, and we don't understand him, then we're not gonna have that true relationship with him. You know, and that's something that I found out like throughout the last few years is just that that it doesn't matter what ministry you run, it doesn't matter you know, what you're doing in life, because if you don't know him, if you don't have that relationship with him, then it's all for not, you know. You could, you could be the biggest giver in your church, you could be here every morning, you know, every Sunday morning, an hour before it starts, be the first one here in the doors and the last one to leave. You could have your own ministry and see millions of people get saved, but if you don't have that relationship with him, that intimate personal relationship that he desires, it's all for not. You know, from the very beginning, when God said, I mean, what did he do every night? He came down in the coolness of the evening so that he could be with Adam and Eve. And that was, his, his, that was what he wanted. He wanted to come down and be with us, be amongst us, you know, and hang out with us and spend time with us. Because we were his kids. We were his children. We, we were very good in his sight. Like, he adored us, you know. And that's God being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Guess what? That's how it still is today. And that's how it was. That's why Jesus Christ came. God with us. Jesus Christ came to reestablish that connection back to God so that we could actually be with him through his son Christ with that connection. You know what? Before that, only certain people could enter the Holy of Holies. But after Jesus Christ and after he was hung on the cross and he died, that shroud was, was ripped in half. And the holies of hope, the holies have opened up, and now guess what? We are the holy of holies. We are the temple that houses God. You know, He wants that, man. That's how much He desires to be with us. You know, that, He's the same. He's not going to change. His one greatest desire is to be with us, His creation, because we were made in His likeness and image. You know, just like I look at my kids, I can see me or my wife. I take no greater joy than just staring at my kids and wanting to be with them because how much they remind me of myself and my wife and just watching them grow up and become the men and women that they are and that I know God created them. God's the same way. He looks at all of us and he says, I want to spend time with each and every one of these people. Like, and he wants to do it individually. And that's how great and big of a God was serving. He said he can do that. He can separate it and that we have them one on one. And that's all he wants is for us to just pause everything else in life and come to him and say, Daddy, Father, I'm going to be with you. Let's talk. Let's hang out. I want to get to know you. And then guess what? He's going to, and he's going to show you all. He wants to just, just tell you everything. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. You know, and we want to know you greater and greater every day. Lord. That, that's... I know that's every single one of ours desires, Lord, is to really know you, to, to build a relationship with you, Lord. Because the more we grow to know you, the more that we're going to understand ourselves, Lord. And ultimately, we want to become like you, Lord. You know, we want our own personal desires to, to die off. And for us, just to, to be in your presence, Lord. And to live from that. You know, when Jesus teaches us to pray, and the Gospel of Matthew, and it says, Hallowed be thy name. It then says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we want to see your kingdom done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we want to see heaven and the earth. And the only way for that to happen is for us to truly understand you, to know you, to know your kingdom, to know your righteousness. Your word tells us to seek that first, to seek your kingdom and righteousness first. Lord, because you want us to have that proper understanding of who you are, where you're coming from. How much you love us, how much you love everybody, so that we can carry your presence everywhere we go, that we can be your ambassadors to this world, and that we can reconcile people back to you, Lord, that we can show them the love of Christ through our lives. But the only way that's going to happen is if we truly understand you. So, Lord, today I just come before you and I ask that you give us a greater understanding, a greater wisdom of who you are, a greater knowledge of who you are, Lord. Allow us to continually grow in you, to seek after you, to understand you, to spend time with you, Lord, like we've never done before, in an intimate setting, Lord, just to come running after you, just like Mary did, and sit at your feet, and just glean from you, Lord. Lord, we love you so much, and we want to serve you with everything that we have. 
and Lord, the only way we can do that is to really know you. So we want to draw near you, Lord, knowing that you're going to draw near us, because that's the promise of your word. When you tell us that, you show us out of the parable of the, the lost son, Lord, of when he comes back, the father just goes running after him to meet him at the end of the driveway, at the end of the road. And Lord, that's who you are, and that's your desire is to be with us, and that you will come running. If we take one or two steps, you'll take that with it. And you'll run the next mile or two to get to us. Just when you see us, come towards you a little bit. Because you are our Father, and we love us that much. We praise you and we thank you. Amen.